I have a question for uh, Rob Skiba. Uh oh. So, are you still set on that on the fact that the Earth is flat? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am set on the fact that the scriptures say that it is. We should just read the Word of God for what it says. I find this thing so ridiculous, and I think I find it so distracting from what is truth. Zach, we want to know the truth. Psalms 119, 142. For thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy Torah is the truth. A lot of people are trying to say this whole flat earth thing is a psyop. It started with the CIA or some other, the Illuminati or whatever. If it's a psyop, it started with Moses. Let's start with, with, with this question. Is the, the Bible a flat earth book? Why or why not? It is not. No, there's not a verse in the Bible that says the earth is flat, period. There's nothing even close to that. It doesn't come from the King James. It's not there. Because if you had verses that said the earth is flat, you would have sent them to me. Let's break it down. We live in a self-contained three-tiered system. These are all the scriptures that tell us so. Quite a few. There is a solid firmament dome vault over us. These are all the scriptures and other extra-biblical texts written by the Hebrews that say the same thing. You who is thrown sits above the heavens, or the waters are above there also. These are the scriptures. Quite a few of them. You know, scripture says it takes two to three witnesses to establish truth. You're noticing that there are more than two or three witnesses showing up here. The earth is inscribed in this circular flat fashion into something with four corners and surrounded by water and all those texts that you see there. The sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament and the stars shall fall to earth. That one's a heavy one right there. We'll talk about that a little bit more. There are floodgates or windows in the firmament. We see in the text right there. The earth is geocentric, stationary. It's a stationary world set on pillars as we see there. I found an article written by Dr. Michael Heiser. It was written about three years ago. In the article he wrote, uh, literal creationists are actually only selective literalists, or as I would call them, inconsistent literalists. If one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description of Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both Testaments, you'd come out with a round, flat earth complete with solid dome over the earth and earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath, etc. But creationists who claim the literal mantle don't do that, since the results are clearly non-scientific. My view, this is Dr. Michael Heiser now, as readers know, is that we ought to simply let the text say what it says and let it be what it is. It was God's choice to prompt people living millennia ago to produce this thing we call the Bible. And so we dishonor it if we impose our own interpretive context on it. Our modern evangelical contexts are alien to the Bible. Frankly, any context other than the context in which the biblical writers were moved to write is foreign to the Bible. So who's the literalist now, he says. I've pointed out this inconsistency before for ex in, for example, my online lecture about Genesis and its pre-scientific cosmology. What Genesis describes is consistent with all other ancient Near Eastern creation models and shares the vocabulary and motifs of those other pre-scientific cosmologies. That's Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, if you want to get to know who this guy is, you can check him out on Logos.com. Go to Logos.com for Logos Bible Software. Logos.com forward slash academic forward slash bio forward slash Heiser. The Old Testament shares terms and ideas with the ancient Near Eastern pagans. And we've, we talked a little bit about this last week. This should not be a surprise because there are similarities between the conception of how the world that we experience was made that are shared with Israel's neighbors. We see these terms as metaphorical, the terms that I'm going to cover tonight. We, we look at them, you know, when the Old Testament says something like that the sky is supported by pillars. Oh, that's just metaphorical. It's just poetic. To us it is, and you know why? Because we have a scientific worldview. Some people marvel at the fact that the universe has, over billions of years, given birth to beings who can appreciate its complexity. We can even ponder where, 
and how we fit in. But at the dawn of history, people thought they knew the answers to these profound questions. The ancients viewed their world as a snow globe. It was essentially a flat earth, say a disk, covered by a dome. Uh, and we call this in English a firmament. And in the firmament is where all the stars and the planets were hung. Almost all ancient cultures believed their universe existed in a dome similar to this one. And they never questioned who created it. The ancients assumed that there was a god or gods responsible for the creation and the maintenance of the universe. The idea that God created the universe went largely unchallenged until the Middle Ages, when scientists made a sacrilegious suggestion based on their observations. The sun, not the earth, was at the center of the universe. It was a paradigm shift. There is now another way to explain the naturally occurring phenomena around us, and this is science. That's why. They didn't. They were serious. No ancient person ever scaled a mountain. Do you realize that? Like the tall mountains? Because it takes oxygen, they freeze. I mean, all this kind of special equipment. There's no record that any of them ever did it. Okay, until the fifth, it wasn't until the 15th century that we have you know, the whole issue resolved of, can you sail this way and come out the other? Right? You know, the, the whole idea about the Earth being a globe and all that kind of stuff, that, that was debated up into the 15th, you know, 15th century. We look at that and go, oh, you know, it's just poetic. It is to us. But what I'm going to say is, again, back to my introduction, if you take it literally, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were serious about it. All these concepts and even some of the terms are part of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. In other words, what I'll show you tonight, the division of the world, what the world looks like in Israeli cosmology, you'll, you can find the same descriptions anywhere else, Egypt, Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Syria, the Hittites, whatever. Because this was a common worldview. Now, if we say that Israel knew better through special divine revelation, then we have a problem. Then we have to say that the literature of the pagans, I mean, somehow they knew too. Did God speak to them? Where'd they get that information? I really don't want pagan literature to be in any way even looking inspired. Okay, I... That's just a, that opens a real, real can of worms for inspiration. It's just ground we need to stay away from, and for good reason. It's legitimate to stay away from it. If we let the Bible be what it is, though, we can claim it's unique theologically in what it says about God. But if not, then pagan literature is essentially on the same level. And trust me, you don't want to go there. You want it to be unique. Let's get into it here. Exodus 24. Israelite cosmology has three tiers. This is the Ten Commandments passage. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Three levels. New Testament is the same. Philippians 2.8, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. What, like the worms? No. no we're, we're gonna see what they were thinking here. Revelation five, heaven, earth, under the earth. It's a three-tiered cosmology. This is what it would look like. I didn't make this graphic, which is why it looks cool, okay? Somebody gave this to me because they hated, honestly, at Western, uh, they, they hated the one I used and so they gave me this one. This is a three-tiered cosmology. There's God. We're going to see it in the verses. I'll show you that God lives above the vault of heaven, the firmament. And in the firmament, you have windows and doors. And you have the earth. We're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round, flat earth here. Underneath is Sheol. Sheol can be both the grave, and it can also be the underworld. Okay, it's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. 
And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is what an Israelite, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level, same with the Mesopotamians. Now, they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views of what's going on here, not just who made it, but what's going on. Views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And if we look at Genesis this way, it doesn't matter that Genesis is, and the rest of the Bible is littered with this kind of cosmological language because God didn't bother to change the culture. He could have if he wanted to. He didn't care. If he had cared, he would have done it. The only other conclusion is that he couldn't, and then you have a problem with omnipotence. Okay? God doesn't care. I'm coming to these people at this time, in this place. They're, it's second millennium B.C. They don't know it's B.C. yet because Jesus doesn't come. But it's a long time, okay, way, 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 way back. And I'm going to give them a message, and they're going to do the best they can under my influence to express it. I'm going to watch as they write. If they goof up, I'm going to send somebody along. Yeah, go fix that. You know, they didn't quite get it right. Somebody will come along and clean that up a little bit. When it gets done with the process, God can look at this thing we call the Bible and say, good job. It's pretty good. I'm satisfied with that. But all of that content is fixed in a particular worldview that we don't have. Okay, we have to let it be what it is. And let God, let God's decision to do it that way settle with us. And my challenge to you is try it. <laughs> okay, if you do that, you don't need to justify it to science. They need to justify why they're criticizing it for not being what it was never intended to be. And that would be an interesting conversation. Don't accept that the way they articulate the debate. All right. That's where I'll end that. So clearly, Dr. Michael Heiser fully acknowledges that the Bible absolutely argues in favor of a still flat circular earth with a dome over it. I mean, let that sink in, guys. Go read this guy's bio. A Semitic language expert acknowledges that the Hebrews had the same cosmology as the ancient Near East, which was just the same way it's depicted in the Logos Bible software picture. Now, I said it, and people mocked me, and they dismissed it, and they said that the whole biblical flat earth thing, you know, that was just a myth that, that showed up a couple hundred years ago to make Christians look stupid. No, guys. It was the dominant view of the ancient world. Face it. That's what it was until about 1,500 years ago. And this is confirmed, again, by a highly educated intellectual who's one of the big content contributors to Logos Bible Software, and he's got alphabet soup, you know, style name with letters after it. Okay, so again, if you don't want to believe me, the village idiot, then believe him. I mean, the guy, you know, he, he paid lots of money so people would actually acknowledge that he knows what he's talking about. Now, that said, he, he, he was, you heard him in the, in the previous session there say that Genesis is uh, about theological messaging. And he, he's basically making the case that the Bible is just there to give us theology, you know, how uh, to understand our relationship with God. Well, hey, that's true, but the creator of the cosmos told several authors and he read a bunch of them and i put a whole bunch more in in the stuff that i wrote long before i ever read any of his stuff you know he, the holy spirit inspired these guys to describe the earth a very specific way you know mike says well you know god never felt it the need to correct them in their apparent uh wrong interpretation or understanding well wait a minute why would god have to correct them he's the one that inspired them to write it in the first place you'd have to correct himself He's the one that told him to write it that way. So if you want to blame somebody about where this flat earth thing comes from, blame God, because he's the one that told the authors to write it this way. You know, the facts are the facts. That's what the Bible says. If you're going to trust the Bible, then then there you go. <laughs> Welcome to my side of this whole thing. I can't let this thing go because I do trust the Bible, and I'd say you could take it literally, and I've been known for preaching that. So now I'm in a pickle. Because, like it or not, folks, from Genesis to Revelation, your Bible is a flat earth book.
These flat earthers are doing the work of Satan to basically make the Bible look stupid. And that's what you're doing if you're one of these flat earth people. You're going around making the Bible look stupid and literally people will go to hell because of this kind of deception. It's only idiots in the dark ages who thought that it was flat, okay, 500 years ago. It was just a bunch of dark age buffoons who thought that, okay, and Roman Catholics and so stuff that, that were teaching that um, as, as part of their way of keeping people in darkness in the Middle Ages. But before that, people knew it was round, and after that, people knew it was round. It's that simple. But honestly, my message to you, if you have been sucked into this flat earth thing, is to repent of the wicked sin of foolishness. Over and over again, God says that foolishness is a sin. And foolishness means stupidity. Don't be stupid here. Don't be a tool of Satan promoting this garbage. There are the people who are behind it. I think the people who make these videos like the 75 Bible verses or this Rob Skiba or whatever his name is, these people are evil people. They're just doing this to do the work of Satan, just to make asses out of God's people, make them all look like fools. And he's doing a pretty good job making people look like retards. With, you say, well, why are you so harsh about this? Look, because I hate every false way. It makes me angry to hear the word of God blasphemed. And every time you say the Bible teaches that the earth is flat, you are being blasphemous. You are making a mockery of the word of God and you need to repent of your stupidity and foolishness and quit making a mockery of the holy, eternal word of God that is perfect in every way. And I'm here to defend the Bible and say, no, the Bible does not teach the stupidity because there are people out there that are smart enough to know that it's round. And when they hear you say that stupidity, then they're going to turn around and say, oh, the Bible's stupid. No, the Bible's not stupid. You're stupid.